Well, the gospel today comes from John. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven, op see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. In this uh, fragment of a greater story, Jesus is beginning to build his congregation. And his congregation is going to be one of those, as we follow him through Scripture, that grows exponentially and shrinks suddenly, expanding and shrinking. It will, it will expand into the thousands. He'll have a megachurch at some point. And then it'll shrink at the cross to just a handful. But over the years of his ministry, this will be a repeating kind of thing. He'll get a big crowd and then he'll say something that hacks them off. And a whole bunch of them leave. He'll tell them, you have to give away your possessions. And most of them leave with that. Or he'll say, hey, you know, the system we live in is not fair to the poor and the marginalized and the outcast. And he'll lose a whole bunch more. And that's the way Christianity has evolved over the years. It grows, it contracts, it grows and it contracts. But in the middle, in the core, are the few faithful disciples. And in this passage, we hear the call of Nathaniel. Now, interestingly enough, in, in this particular passage with Nathaniel being called, it's the only place, in John, it's the only place where Nathaniel shows up as a list of, on the list of disciples. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they have their lists, but they don't include Nathaniel. We're not really sure why that is. Perhaps it's because in the memory of John's community, which is a newer memory, I, it's an actually, it's a younger gospel. Perhaps the memory has evolved a little bit over the years. But one thing that John develops in his understanding of Jesus is that Jesus always was, always is, and always will be. That the Christ has been with God since the very beginning. The creative force was in Christ in the very beginning. Remember he talks, we read here a couple weeks ago, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That's his, un yes, thank you. I got a yes. Someone remembered. <laughs> Everybody else go, huh? <laughs> but the word Christ is an eternal word in John's understanding of this relationship with God. And it never goes away. But it does require disciples. Always it requires disciples. Without a community of faith, there is no transmittal of the faith. There's no continuation. There's no continuity. The community of faith becomes essential in the community of believers. So here we have Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree. Anyone know why he was sitting under a fig tree? It doesn't say, does it? Sometimes parts of stories get lost, and we really don't know what the fig tree means. I search all over my references, and honestly, no one can come to a conclusion. People offer 
ideas, but you know, it could be the representing the I, the one I like the best is it, that the fig tree represents the Garden of Eden. And Jesus is saying, Nathaniel, I knew you since the beginning of creation. I can't. <laughs> There's another sermon going on right over here. <laughs> it is not bad. Let us listen in. <laughs> but <clears throat> I like that one. I like that. I like to think that's consistent with John. I could be wrong. It's okay. This is, a, this is something you can believe without doing much harm. But Jesus says, basically, I knew you before I saw you. I knew you when you were doing something else. Now, <clears throat> Nathaniel has to go through several steps to become a disciple. He has to first surrender. You know, he has this skepticism. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Probably kind of like, you know, we might say... Can anything good come out of Los Angeles? I'm picking on L.A. because it's not my favorite city. <clears throat> you know, maybe just a kind of a repeated bias, prejudice, whatever. But he's skeptical. And so first, before he can become a disciple, he has to overcome some of that skepticism. And he has to surrender to Jesus. And Nathaniel does that. He surrenders to the authority of Jesus. And then he has to trust so that he can move to the next. He can no longer be skeptical of Jesus, but trust. Trust and obey, the hymn says, for there's no other way. And so his second step is to to trust in Jesus, and then to go and do, to follow, to act. Because in the epistle of John, we hear that with faith is dead without works. And so something has to happen. There has to be an action. And those are fairly commonly understood steps. But there's one other step in here. One other requirement before any of this can happen. I had an aunt. I'm not really sure what her genetic relationship was, but I was some, she was the daughter of some great aunt or something like that. Aunt, aunt Donta, we called her. Didn't like her. She was always giving words of wisdom that didn't make much sense. One I remember, particularly, when I asked her a question, she said, curiosity killed the cat. What a terrible thing to say to a kid. A kid who didn't know that there was a retort for that. Satisfaction brought him back. You know, either way, at least you have, for a moment, you have a dead cat. You know, children should be seen, but not heard. That was another one of her favorites. Anything to stifle my curiosity. And my brothers as well, my other cousins. Aunt Donna wasn't that popular with us. There's a possibility that she was that way because she didn't have any answers. I don't know. <laughs> but she tried to stifle our curiosity. You know, my, my first appointment, a very nice lady in the church, but strongly opinionated. There aren't many of those in churches anymore, but I told her I was going to be going to a uh, three-day seminar. She said, what do you need to do that for? I said, well, it's continuing education. And she says, 
but you just got out of seminary. You don't need any more education. <laughs> kind of reminded me of my Aunt Donna. Why would you be curious? Haven't you learned everything already? Well, I did go to that seminar, and, and what I've discovered over the years is what I learned in seminary was barely a beginning. What I learned in college was barely a beginning. If I learned anything in those places, it was ways in which to continue learning. And Nathaniel has a curiosity. Because when he's asked to check this out, he checks it out. He asks the question, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's a curious question. Question of curiosity. It's not just an insult to Nazarenes. But really? That's a backwater, jerkwater kind of place. Really? Can anything good come out of Ramona? We know the answer, of course. But the question is, do we have the curiosity to check things out, to challenge what we've heard and what we've learned, to make sure that things haven't changed, that the world hasn't evolved? And if you think it hasn't, please, check it out. We know it's evolved. And Christ is not for the world that was, but Christ is for the world that is. Are our assumptions, are the things that we've always taken for granted, are they truly true? Or is it time to take a new look? You know, there's a real problem in gathering our information from one single source. You get a lot of trouble doing that. There have been three recent university studies, one notably from the uh, University of Maryland, that discovered that folks who get most of their news from Fox are less informed and more misinformed than people who get their news sources from other sources, all other sources. But they don't switch the channel as often either. Now, I'm not saying don't listen to Fox. If you want to listen to Fox, go right ahead. But change the channel once in a while. Get your information from someplace else. Find something that challenges the assumptions that you've always had. I mean, how often do we look for news sources, information sources that affirm and confirm our previously held convictions? And when we do that, what's one thing we don't have to do? What's two things we don't have to do? Think or change your mind. Change or change your mind. And yet all the great wisdom teachers of the world say there are two things that are essential for the good life. To love, and we talk about that a lot. But the other is to gain knowledge. For it is in gaining knowledge that we gain understanding that empowers our love to be effective. Ignorant love can be damaging, can be destructive. And God does not call us to ignorance. God calls us to knowledge. It distresses me so much to, to hear and, and hear it broadcast all over that somehow there's a conflict between religion and science as to which is true. One requires us to change our mind about the other always. But it's a bootstrapping kind of thing. It's an advancing kind of thing. And one understanding one and trying to understand the other moves us forward. Remember that the physical world is God's creation too. And we learn to understand it by being curious. How did God construct the atom? 
How does God construct the atmosphere? How does God construct our bodies? It's important to be curious. It's essential to be curious. Because when we stop learning, we become dead. A dead body doesn't learn. It decays. And we can have that happen to us spiritually as well. We are like Nathaniel. We were sitting in a comfortable place under a fig tree, but curiosity drew us out. I hope and I pray that the reason you come to church is to learn something new. Even if you don't agree, and it's okay. But learn something new. Learn a different perspective. Do we get curious and check out our scriptures? Are we curious enough? At the bottom of your bulletin, next week's scriptures, one of those will be preached on. Are we curious enough to know what those are? You know it'll take you all of four minutes to read them all? Are we curious enough to look at that? Are we ready so that we can surrender to Christ at the right time? That we can trust Christ? And that we can do Christ's bidding? It requires mind. One of the attributes of God. Mind. And when we do, we begin to see the gospel in action. As Jesus puts it in this passage, the angels descending and ascending on him. He, the communication with God, the channel to God. And we become blessed by communication with God that comes from our curiosity. So my challenge then is question. Question what you already know. Seek new horizons. God's waiting there, waiting to talk to you, waiting to answer your questions. In Jesus' name.